it's when you blend that creativity and empathy together it drives 20% more effectiveness if you can actually get that happy marriage of creativity and empathy Hey there, James here and you're listening to the Own the Moment podcast, the show where we explore the complex and always evolving landscape of marketing, advertising and branding and try to get to the bottom of what it means to be a truly memorable brand. The Own the Moment podcast is brought to you by Como Technologies, a self-service, complete customer engagement platform that helps you cut through the noise to truly connect with your customers and retain and grow those connections over time. With Como, you can build and deploy new campaigns, activations, promotions, and programs in days, not months. And our software is used by some of the world's biggest consumer brands from Heineken to Budget, Goodman Fielder, Foxtel, JLL, Williams Racing, and McDonald's. Learn more at Como.tech. Why is it that TV ads are so predictable these days? Pretty much every car ad still features a car speeding along a long and winding road. And if you see an ad featuring fluffy white animals, you can be sure it's an ad for toilet paper. This week, we're diving into the world of advertising cliches and category conventions. I had the pleasure of speaking with Samira Brophy, a senior director of creative excellence at Ipsos, a global research firm dedicated to understanding how advertisers can be more effective. Samira and her team have explored the cultivation of conformity in advertising, where campaigns often gravitate towards the safe and familiar. But they've also uncovered something quite remarkable, the power of empathy and creativity to transform these cliches into something familiar, yet refreshingly original. Samira says great advertising is just like great stand-up comedy. The funniest jokes are those where we sit back and think, that's so true, but I've never thought about it that way before. Familiar, but fresh. In our discussion, we delve into why advertisers continue to lean on these cliches, and more importantly, how breaking free from category conventions can infuse campaigns with a sense of creativity and empathy, resulting in advertising that truly resonates and delivers significant commercial uplift. I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, Samira Brophy, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, James. So I want to start with this idea of that our brains are pre-wired to favour the safe and familiar, which seems you know perfectly natural from an evolutionary perspective. Um, why do brands fall into the trap of playing into our safe and familiar desires? <laughs> yes, we are very risk averse. Uh, we often make suboptimal choices. Uh, because they feel safe and familiar, we reference past experiences, and we choose outcomes that may not necessarily be optimal. And we do this to manage risk, and ultimately brands are run by people. And I think a lot of the language used around creativity and advertising is uh, kind of leans the opposite way. You know, you hear about risk and breaking things and subversions. <laughs> and um, so I see, I, and I understand why, you know, people do it because you want to find a client that aligns to your worldview. But um, ultimately, I think broadly speaking, serving up a big platter of risk to a business that's basically looking for accountability does create a certain amount mm. of um tension and may, may, may not be ironically the most effective way to land the awesome power of creative advertising to, you know, sell a brand, product, service or idea, which is effectively what it's meant to do, but also its astonishing mm. capacity to build goodwill and build a competitive edge. I mean, if you think about the example of Volkswagen, you know, 2015, they had this huge emission scandal. And if you look at the share price and how it drops off a cliff for 2015, it recovers fairly quickly. And I would argue that that recovery is from having 30 years of excellent advertising and goodwill in the bank. You know, I guess there's this idea in society that you know, it's, it's uh, how brands uh, act and what they do is, you know, more important than ever. Mm. But I guess that Volkswagen example with the emission scandal, which, you know, right, I don't, you know, almost forgot about it. Um, do you have a view on, you know, how real is, is that idea today that, um, you know, consumers really sort of punish or reward brands based on, on how they act? Um, well, that's a very nuanced point, right? Because at the end of the day, advertising is... Uh it is a very powerful force, so use it wisely. 
Um, mm. And the thing is, advertising does have the power to, you know, teach you that uh, maybe you should use the have the, have the BG staying alive mm. in your head while you perform CPR. Um, you know, it helps you spotlight choices as consumers. It uh, puts money into the economy. The Deloitte study says that for every one pound of ad spend, it puts six pounds back into the GDP of the UK economy, for example. So I think it's a nuanced picture. There is a line and you do need checks and balances. And uh, checks and balances come in the form of a gold standard regulator, which I think, um, Mm. you know, uh, either countries have or are moving towards, particularly around Mm. kind of sustainability standards and kind of inclusion and stereotyping. But uh, consumer pressure is important as well. So there are mechanisms in place uh, to to kind of uh, mitigate uh, mitigate effects. But yes, advertising does certainly sense. help you get over your PR crisis, providing you've done the hard yards to kind of rectify what was wrong in the first place. But advertising will help you, or at least a good history of advertising will help you to deal with that more effectively. Right. And I guess, again, in that Volkswagen case, you know, as you said, 30 years of, of positive brand building and advertising was was beneficial there. Going back to this idea of like the safe and familiar Samira. So like, um, you know, you said there that, you know, we hear so much about creatives and advertising being about boldness and standing out. Um, is there value, though, in the safe and familiar? I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you've explained mm. quite well, you know, why we seek familiarity. Um, but there must be some benefit in advertisers playing into our, uh, you know, our, our brains being pre-wired to favour fam- familiarity. What's your view on on that balance of standing out uh, versus playing into those? Yeah, and I yeah, think it, it, it depends on the flavour of the familiarity and w- what it is that you're being familiar about. The thing is, okay, so let's let's start from the beginning a little bit, right? Because you know the studies show that. Companies do value creativity. They think it's really important to drive their business, but they have a really hard time getting it over the line. Um, hmm. But because it, it 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 carries a risk. But what then happens is that you know they regress to kind of safe and um, tried and tested kind of category cliches. Um, mm. But what that does is that it kind of. Um, lends itself to making near identity kit ad- advertising. So I think familiar is fine as long as, as long as it's familiarity to your brand or familiarity to something that people value in their lives. But I think familiarity in terms of looking like everything else in the category is a little more dangerous because you don't get the attribution as a brand that you should uh, by having a fresh take on it. So this this is the thing. So. Uh, taking risks and and being disruptive is not always about being loud. It's not always a loud process. You can do it quietly. It's more about mm. you know having a twist on on the familiar and what you already know. Mm. That's interesting because like that's you're right. There's something sort of that on the surface feels quite like um, yeah. In my mind, when I think about that sort of bold. Um, you know, new, innovative, you know, for, yeah, I, for me, I, in my mind, I, I see and hear loud, um, you know, outspoken, but you're right, it doesn't necessarily um, have to be that way. Um, Samira, you've talked about this, like, cultivation of conformity. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, how does this all impact effectiveness? So, you know, walk me through how... Um, conformity in, in advertising um, impacts of, uh, effectiveness and and why do we know that to be uh, the case? How, how do we know that is the case? So um, I guess one of the evidence points around conformity uh, and effectiveness that I will put forward is from the Ipsos database where we've seen that advertising that actually breaks or doesn't conform to the category cliches tends to get a 20% better chance of landing branded attention. And that is your kind of of Mm. price of entry or cinema ticket, if you will, to kind of effectiveness. Because if you don't get encoded in people's minds and if your brand isn't retained as part of that process, then um, you may be doing a job, you know, driving the category forward and, and, Mm. and, Marketing theory generally says that brands can grow by driving category growth. So you will get some, but Mm. it's, it's, you can get disproportionately more by doing a good job for um, your brand more specifically. 
So it's it's about kind of yeah. um, the the marginal gains and the, the big gains actually that you can you can get by uh, being a little bit um, standing out from the pack. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, this idea of, you know, being conformist within a category, do you have any examples top of mind as to brands that have done that particularly well, uh, which have sort of broken the category convention, I guess, so to speak? Are there any that uh, stand out in your mind that the audience might recognise and therefore start to understand that pattern that you're talking about? Yeah, um, I think um, some of the ads that really kind of stand out to me as having broken category conventions. So I think of Virgin Atlantic. Um, so the work by Lucky Generals is brilliant because mm. it doesn't look like any other airline ad, but you're very clear that it's mm. for an airline. And more importantly, you're very clear that it's for Virgin Atlantic. And that, I think, is the is the rub and the way you do it. Um, the other one recently that I've been really impressed by is a uh, Fiat, <laughs> where they basically uh, dunk the CMO of Stellantis in a Fiat, in a giant, into a giant can of paint to say that Fiat's going to, it's Operation No Grey. Uh, they're going to not make grey cars anymore, even though they are their top selling line. They're kind of harking back to the mm. brand's kind of Italianness and 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 the tone of voice is very authentic to, to Fiat. And I think that was a lovely piece of work as well. Yeah. And so I I did see that Fiat ad and I thought it was great. What do you think, uh, just like mechanically speaking, Samira, what is it about that Fiat ad that you think, um, you you know, why why does that break category convention? If you could just walk through a little bit more of the detail as, you know, what in your view, I don't know how um, deep or sort of how how much you've studied that ad um, and let me know if not, but, you know, it would be interesting for me to just hear like what about that is, uh, non-conformist because um, in my mind I guess you know you know there's always been car ads which are sort of potentially I don't know um, creative or um, interesting what what about that did you feel was sort of breaking convention well actually I would argue that the car ad the automotive advertising category is full of category cliches you often see winding roads beautiful people hair flying lend up somewhere aspirational they're going to go surfing after and it's a way of indicating right. the functional benefits of the car and there's a lot of category advertising that falls in that space so it's nice mm. to see that things have been a little bit you know uh, uh, taking a different perspective i think that's what's broken category convention and there are hundreds of categories by the way that have the category cliches but i think the thing that virgin and fiat have done really well is is basically just basic best in class ad strategy so it's about knowing your brand (laughs) inside and out Mm -hmm. knowing what your campaign platform is knowing your target audience. And once you have all of those tools and knowing the category as well, and once you have, and what the codes are, and once you have all of those tools in your toolbox, then you can be an artist and, you know, play with it and, mm. and sketch and draw and like, you know, and, and that's where the craft comes in to make it something that people really kind of relate to and will, will remember. So it's it's kind of the two sides of the coin around strategy and uh, and craft coming together. But that strategy piece and like knowing your brand, I think is is one of the most fundamental uh, fundamental things. Mm, that's interesting. And I think, yeah, I, I think you're right there, Samir. I think, you know, the more you, when you spoke about winding roads and, you know, the families going to the beach, I, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, those cliches are, Instantly, shall sort we of play? Top of shall mind, we play yeah. a game, James? Shall we play the category cliche yes, game? Would love okay, to. all right. Okay, I'll go first. So, uh, a large group of women laughing and smiling, and riding bikes and going out on a night out, and everybody's in white trousers. Um. Uh. What do you call them? Uh, pants. Yes. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> oh, I, 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 you spooked me for a minute there. I thought, oh my god, I don't even know what those are called. That would have been a bad podcast moment. But yeah, yeah, that's um, that's fun. Okay, I'm I'm gonna go. Um, uh, elderly person being helped across the street by a younger citizen. Oh my goodness! Elderly person being helped by a younger person. Uh. Pass. I don't know. This is this is. 
Oh, I, I was thinking private health insurance. Oh, oh my God, you're so right. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But you're right. It's funny. It's it, it is. It's sort of depressing in a way, isn't it? That you know that game is sort of not that hard. No, that's interesting. And, and so, uh, I want to move the discussion, Samiri, into like this idea of defining creativity because I've read before that you said that you know the the industry lacks a shared language around creativity. Like it's a thing that everyone says, and I have probably said it ten times today in meetings. Uh, but what does it actually mean? So, what's your view on how the advertising industry could move towards a more shared or common sort of language around creativity and why is it a problem that there isn't one well i mean okay let's in terms of scale of problems it's probably uh, not on the same scale as climate change but is, we're having a discussion about creativity and advertising <laughs> okay so it makes it a bit hard to kind of have that discussion and and by by extension effectiveness if we can't agree on what we actually mean by creativity and advertising and when you look around at the marketing effectiveness kind of Think space, um, there's a lot of definitions and it's very kind of driven by, you know, the thought leaders, by the agency experts and by brands. But I think what we felt was a little bit, and, and it varies, right? So I think I touched on this a little bit. It varies from being sort of chaos and breaking and subversive to sort of the more gentle taste and balance and sincerity and selling. Mm. So there's, there's a lot of like terminology around there. So the, and the voice that we felt at Epsos was slightly missing was the voice of the people basically um, whose uh, job the advertising is actually tasked to influence, and that's just regular people. So we asked them, <laughs> uh, 20,000 odd people in eight countries about, you know, what comes to mind when they think about creativity and advertising. And and we looked at, you know, we did a text analysis of all of the words that they surfaced up and they grouped into a few large clusters. Basically, they talked about freshness mm. or originality, but that was connected to experiences like entertainment and fun and joy and happiness or just being very interesting to them and there was an appreciation of a production quality as well so the craft side of things so it's if we kind of define it as a sort of um paraphrasing the words of regular people um you know they've kind of told us that it's a fresh or original experience or a different experience that delivers value to them and that value can come in the form of the fun or the entertainment basically you're creating a sense of value exchange basically you're being you're being charming witty humorous using all the tools in your toolbox to to um thank them for their frankly for their attention At attention <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um, do you think you know i guess like the sort of um i had um uh orlando wood on the show a few weeks ago and he you know we talked about sort of the crisis of creativity and that effectiveness has been going down for a long time and you know his whole thesis about the sort of left brain mm. thinking that has sort of overtaken uh not only advertising but society at large and i do you know small plug go and listen to that episode because we went in depth do you think that this is related in some way to are these concepts related that like because we can't define creativity, it's hard to be creative? Or do you see any link between this sort of lack of shared understanding and common language and then maybe the, the cliches and the, um, the conformity that we see in advertising? Uh, I, think they, I, I think they are connected. I mean, everything in business like has, has an underlying issue. We know about short-termism. We know about, you know, quarterly reporting mm. and therefore, you mm. know, kind of, the, the pressure that that puts on the individuals in, in brands and businesses and uh, companies to kind of demonstrate worth. And it's very difficult sometimes to make a case to go, okay, six years down the line, you're going to see an amazing benefit. You're going to be the you mm. know leading brand in the category and, um, you know, you're going to be incredibly memorable. It's kind of, it, it's a hard, it's a hard sell. And it, you know, and I can, it goes back to the point I made about, risk aversion and, you know, how we're uh, naturally hardwired to do that. So I think that is a fundamental, that is a fundamental uh, point in our, uh, there's a fundamental case about our kind of evolutionary trace, I guess, but also the way mm. business is therefore set up. But I, I think to, to, to offer the good life, I guess, on that point is that um, the reason that evolutionary trace 
exist is because we minimize risk, but we are also quite a collective species. And there, you know, and mm. the cases where you see great examples is where people have the the ability to kind of rally the collective, you know, presenting to the business a platform of, you know, this is what this is what good will look like and and is able to sell that in. So that's really interesting. So something something that sort of um uh I'm thinking about as we go through this conversation is like there's um like cliches and conformity and then stereotypes. Um, I know you've written a lot about stereotypes in particular. I know you've also uh, recently published a piece on uh, uh, gender stereotypes in advertising. Um, you, you, you wrote in one of your pieces recently sort of un-stereotyping, I think you called it, as, a, as an approach that brands could take. Talk, talk a little bit about how stereotypes play into this and, and you know, what opportunities are there for, for brands to do un-stereotyping. And I know you put out some really fascinating research and numbers around particularly the gender issue recently it would be great to walk through that yeah sure I'd be happy to but if you if you wouldn't mind indulging me for a minute I think it's because I think like everything is connected right so um, I just want to talk a little bit about the misfits research that we did first because mm. it's really important and and it, it is connected to this and it's connected to nonconformity. What we've seen is that um, when we look at advertising responses from regular people, again, very bottom up, let's just do it from uh, people's perspective based on how they have how they have parsed ads, right? It's not a brand saying something mm. is emotional. It's the person saying, yes, that had an, em- like that provoked an emotional response to me. And so, so when we look at the different, types of advertising experiences what we found is that there is creativity so like creativity that relates to the experience of the ad so that's you know it's surprising mm-hmm. it's entertaining there's creativity that is slightly more rooted in the in the brand side of things so that's more about you know showing things a bit differently brand reappraisal news and there's this bit in mm-hmm. the middle that is has really got nothing to do with the creative side it's more about reflecting people in their real lives and it's more about kind of fit with the brand and it's more about empathy so let's call it empathy and fitting in and we then looked at how these advertising experiences relate to effectiveness and effectiveness uh, based on the creative effect index in our pre-testing which by the way is validated to short-term sales using market mix modeling so a really kind of Mm. robust measure um, and it's done with generalizable cases not awards cases and it mm. covers a broad church of categories and that's very important right because mm. you want to see if it if it works across a, a, a bunch of different categories as well and pretty much th- mm. the evidence was very interesting because it basically told us that creativity or empathy by themselves advertising advertising that does well on that tends to regress to the mean but it's when you blend that creativity and empathy together you get a 20% uplift in terms of being uh, being in the highest um, position on the creative effect index. So it drives 20% more effectiveness if you can actually get that happy marriage of uh, creativity and empathy. So let's just call it the fresh and familiar. It's it's very, very satisfying because I know you had Andy Nairn on the show last and he mm. talked about stand-up comics. And basically this is yes. sort of the evidence around that because they have a gift of finding the... Yes. Ordinary, the extraordinary in the ordinary. So again, it's not about being loud. Now, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because it's been a pretty consistent theme. Empathy and fitting in has been a pretty consistent theme throughout all of the work that we've done. And, you know, you'd you'd think that empathy and fitting in is at odds with breaking category convention, but it's not. (laughs) It's 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 really not because you can do both of those things and breaking category conventions can be done with the creativity part and the empathy part is about kind of reflecting the brand and reflecting people. OK, and and, and how this relates to unstereotyping is that empathy, respectful portrayal and a healthy dose of creativity are not mutually exclusive and uh, mm. there is a lot of headroom for brands to show a slightly different world than they currently do. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's really interesting. I, yeah, I, I uh, thank you for taking us back a couple of steps before we got there. So there's something in, you know, um, 
that empathy piece that I just want to sort of like double click on. So like what what do you what how do you define empathy in that uh, in this context? Is it sort of just uh, you know saying I see you to a a consumer or a customer? Is it sort of reflecting themselves back? Um, you know, what, how do how do you think about empathy it, in it, this it, context? What does it mean to be empathetic in advertising? Yeah. Um, and and I just want to stress that it's kind of empathy and fitting in, and this goes back to where do you right. find your insight from? Okay, so insights for advertising can come mm. from everywhere. It could be a product insight. It could be a human broad human truth about. I don't know, parenting, mm. life, football. It can be a mm. shopper insight. I mean, think about Old Spice. That was basically a shopper insight about, oh, guess what? It's the women that buy the body wash for men. So let's make an ad for, for women and let's make it really oh, funny and give them a bloody good show. So the thing is, mm. I think it's about empathy and fitting in. So it doesn't. it's not always 100% about reflecting exactly the audience that you're that you're, you're, you, you've built against, although that is helpful. Uh, but it can also mm. be about fitting with what you already know about the brand's world. So fit with the brand is mm. also part of that fitting in piece. And, and doing it in a credible way, believability is the third kind of advertising experience within the empathy piece. So that there's, it's not that you have to do all three, but if you, you know, at least, at least if you get one of those things right. So coming back to Virgin Atlantic... The advertising they make is unmistakably Virgin Atlantic um, because mm. they do that that empathy fitting in piece very very well. It fits with the brand, but you still manage to pe- show people uh, a different brand take on the brand world. Yeah, yeah. I, I I guess Apple is another example of that sort of um, that sort of brand. I just want to also say yes. We had Andy Nan on the show a few weeks ago who. Um, uh, was involved in a bunch of that um, uh, Virgin Atlantic work, and uh, yeah, listen to that episode if you want to go deeper there. What about so um, Samira? Like, so on this empathy piece, wh- where, if at all, does challenging the audience come in? Is that sort of is it possible to be both empathetic and challenging? Um, you know, have you seen that work? Have you seen it not work? I'm sort of curious as to this idea of. Um, where that can come in, if at all, in advertising, where it's not necessarily about empathizing and fitting in with the audience, but potentially challenging or pushing back or going in another direction. So I think of advertising like a mirror, right? You can mm. you can point it backwards and show a world that existed. Uh, and let's face it, if you do that, you're probably... Um, harming somebody because you know there's a uh, stereotypes and systemic biases exist and they're upheld mm. by very rigid structures because nobody in power wants to see it okay you can you can either point mm. it to the present and kind of reflect the world as it is today or you can look to the future there's there's lots of different options mm. and ways to do it um so you know it, it really depends on 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 what you want to do with it if you want to do the the creativity and empathy piece it's really again just it's very simple it's about um doing a a fresh twist on what people are already familiar with okay so let me take an example sustainability category i think Mm. volvo again one of my favorite ads of all time i think uh, volvo's ultimate safety test i don't know if you've seen it james but it's not ringing a bell no, okay, but, immediately, but maybe as you describe yeah, it, it'll please sort watch of come it. to Basically, it's, it's um, so a man starts at the Volvo factory. He says, hi, I'm Bjorn, um, and I'm going to show you, uh, you know, how we treat safety at Volvo. He goes through a series of different safety tests that Volvo performs. So first with the crash test dummies, then it's like, and now the off-road test. And, you know, car goes swooping over a huge bump turns over turns turtle Uh, Mm. and the final the final test is a hundred foot drop and so the 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 tests just get more ludicrously hard uh okay so the so we're standing sort of at at this glacial landscape with this car hiked to a crane about to fall to the earth plummet from a hundred feet and then you go, is this the ultimate safety test? And then suddenly there's like a noise and he turns around and there's this iceberg just crumbling behind him. And the super <laughs> comes up to say, climate change is the ultimate safety test. 
that's why starting today all our all our cars are going mm. to be electric it 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 mm. sends me sh- it, it sends shivers up my spine even describing mm. it and you should mm. see the facial coding trace on our testing it's it it looks like a, a a journey and then there's this huge shock surprise big ending but that is a brilliant mm. example of sort of creativity and empathy they've they've told a a really unusual story in the sustainability category with a mm. lot of empathy but also you know it's an extension of Volvo's existing brand platform you've basically um just you know uh, translated safety of drivers to safety of the entire planet um so yes very, yes and and they didn't show a windmill not once. a windmill in sight <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah yeah that that's so in- i will go and watch that straight away that's yeah that that i think that's a really good example i think that's like a great summary in a way of this uh of, of this entire discussion is like how to sort of uh, use creativity as a way to sort of break, uh, break those conventions, but still, you know, doing so in in sort of uh, keeping in uh, keeping in line with yeah. the brand. I think that's- we ha- we have a framework that we talk to our clients about when it comes to um, you know any sort of ESG angle, but really it's pretty applicable to most. So be true to the. This is particularly mm. important for the ESG angle. So, you know, be true to the facts. So you do need a foundation of action. Otherwise you're just coloring in and that never works. Yeah, People will see yeah. through it. Uh, so mm. be true to the facts, be true to the people. So that's down to sort of being really honest, very, very transparent, um, you know, progress, not perfection. It's people can get on board with mm. that. It's okay. Um, right. But also take them on the journey, entertain them and, and, you know, make them surprised, make them shocked. Um, and mm. then finally, and most importantly, be true to the brand. And those are the three principles mm. if you want to make a really strong ESG ad. Mm. <laughs> mm. That's, yeah, that's um, really uh, a nice, clear, I think, way to package up um, a lot of this. Uh, Samir, I could sit here and chat to you all day about this, but I know you're busy. So I want to move on to the quick fire round okay. uh, and ask you what your favorite marketing campaign of all time is. So you know how um, lots of brands and ad agencies, well, the original one was probably Leo Burnett's, but you know how you have this creative scale and the top end of that Leo Burnett's creative scale was, so it kind of goes like, you know, advertising that changes how you feel changes how you think mm. and 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 changes the world uh my favorite marketing effort of all time i think is the adoption of the montreal protocol in 1987 it still blows my mind mm. that the entire world somehow came together to eliminate chlorofluorocarbons from the production <laughs> from production mm. lines and refrigeration i mean and if you think of the divided times we're in now that like thinking back on it gives me a lot of hope i mean the ozone you're in australia james so this affects yeah, you yeah. the ozone layer is actually re- repairing itself because 30 years ago you know a, a group of people were clever enough to think about all of the angles from lobbying influencing policy but also to kind of tap in and find the empathy and the thing that people really cared about or were able to kind of connect with in that debate. It's like, I don't understand the science, but I understand that my Mm. deodorant has an impact. So breaking it down Mm. uh, and and kind of, it was a massive effort and it it really is is a marvelous piece of, I'd say marketing and and actual marketing Mm. that changed the world. Um, Yeah. Uh, but more recently, mm, maybe great... liquid death. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yes, liquid death is a uh, a favorite of mine, and that it's not the first time that's yeah. come up. Um, it's, it's interesting because it's funny. I did see something the other day, uh, and obviously, growing up in Australia, sort of hole in the ozone layer that was just like a constant. And to to actually understand that, like we are fixing that problem, um, I agree. That's a, it's a great um, sort of uh, reason for hope, yeah. actually. Um, we could do with more example. of that now. <laughs> um, we could do with more of that. So what about the best, and I say best in, in sort of air quotes because, I, you know, I guess maybe it's your favourite, but, what, who, you know, what's the best brand in the world right now? Who's doing the best brand marketing and advertising mm. work? So, well, I don't know. This is a bit of a shape-shifting category, right? Because and So, so I'm just going to speak about a brand that's fairly personal to me. I really love Who Gives a Crap Toilet Paper. <laughs> Yeah. I yes. I um 
well, I like them because I I like recommending to re- recommending them to people because it makes me feel good. Everything that they're doing mm-hmm. is just it's just very sensible sort of using fast growing bamboo. Yep. Everything's wrapped in paper. It arrives in bulk. 50% of profits go to sanitation projects and um yep. I like hearing from them because they're really funny and they entertain me. Um yes. and I have not made any compromise on the product quality. So all of that is a co-benefit. Um and I like talking about them because I I think they're misfits and they don't conform to the category convention of fluffy animals, the strength or softness or any of that Clouds, stuff. Clouds, yeah. So, yeah, and I just like buying them because they look so pretty in my loo. So, yeah, bring me a lot of yeah. personal well, and professional yeah. joy, James. <laughs> yeah, I, we're very lucky here. Um, we work out of a WeWork office uh, here and we are, yeah, fully stocked with uh, – who gives a crap? And I, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think sort of, you know, brilliant brand. The, it's funny, like once going through this conversation, now I can't stop thinking about this idea of like category cliches and convention. And yeah, they, they, there's no fluffy clouds and rabbits and, you know. Uh, so I think from in that perspective, you know, that's a huge tick. Um, and obviously, you know, brilliant company with a brilliant mission. Um, all right. So, what's the most overrated trend in marketing right now? What are you sick to death? God, of? I really had to think so hard about this question. Um, really? Okay. One of my bugbears, I think, over the years has been uh, personalization. Because the thing is, I think there are many rabbit holes hmm. you can go down, right? From sort of, you know, over over focusing on generations and the difference between generations to, you know, should I mm. reflect back the exact person that I'm trying to sell to? So I think the over-reliance of personalization, mainly because I've seen in client organizations that it creates a lot of content. And just because you can create a lot of content doesn't mean you should. Right. Um, at, Interesting. At some expense. Uh, uh, and it's a time mm. suck on uh, resource and... Um, and and their time as well. And I haven't always seen the sort of, I guess, effectiveness benefits of it. Sometimes it works, but it's it's it works when a, when you've done it thoughtfully. You know, you've got a, a really you're better off spending your time making a bloody brilliant campaign that people really value right. and enjoy. You've entertained them, you've delighted them, and you've sent them somewhere. Um, and that mm. wherever you've sent them, that landing page is beautifully structured. That kind of caters very simply. You've reduced the friction to all of their consumer journeys, and mm. you've got some robust, hopefully, consumer path to purchase re- research that sits behind all of that. Um, and you've kind of wireframed yourself for success. So, um, so mm. yes, but hyper hyper reliance on personalization mm, yeah it's it's it, it's it i yeah it, personalization feels like one of those sort of you know i mean the it's the classic gartner hype cycle thing you know it's sort of for a while there it was the only thing people were talking about i guess now it's ai yep. um what's uh you know the opposite what's the most underrated trend in marketing right now what what aren't we talking about that we should be a bloody good jingle <laughs> A really, a a really good jingle. I mean, I can sing you songs from, like, I grew up in India and I can still sing you the song for washing powder, Nirma. Uh, Now, uh, it's just stuck in my head. I even, I I think I can even sing a song for, like, Big on Roach Spray. So uh, those are, like, such sticky brand building tactics. And in fact, uh, my colleague Adam Sheridan has done this brilliant paper called A Power of You. And we've actually, because we meta tag all the creative that we test, obviously, we've done this mm. amazing analysis on distinctive assets. And, and it shows that sonic brand cues are eight and a half times more likely to drive high attention. And just to put, but, but they're very underused. So not a lot of ads have them. And just to put that in context, wow. brand characters, which are the next sort of most effective um, device, are six times more likely to drive attention. So there's a lot of there's a lot of untapped potential, I think, in a really good jingle. Yeah, it, it's I, I couldn't agree more. So you know, sort of, I just moved back to Australia after many many years away, actually, um, in Sweden. Um, and it was funny because one of the first days I got in the car and I turned the radio on, there was a you know a couple of radio ads where jingles are, of course, a little bit more common still, but you know many of them hadn't changed in twenty years, and I instantly you know connected with me and i'm like you i can <laughs> recite many a jingle from 90s australian tv ads um and it's funny you say that about characters as well because characters and jingles both feel like these quite outdated sort of daggy tactics um 
which which makes no sense. I had um, uh, Jamie Peat of McCann on, uh, who has done a lot of work with Aldi, and of course their character Kevin, the carrot. Um, and so I'm also utterly convinced that yeah, it's sort of do away with jingles and characters <laughs> at your peril. Um, like you say, they they're great tools. Yeah. Um, Samira, who should I have on the show next? Who who should I be talking to? That I right. So um, so well, Adam Adam is a great person to have on the show. So I think I've like borrowed a lot of his thinking today. So Adam Sheridan is definitely a recommendation. Mm. But the other other two, and I would suggest like a tag team. Um, so Hazel Freeman from Ipsos, but Lee Rolston from JKR as well. They have done an amazing piece of work on distinctiveness. It's called "Be Distinctive Everywhere." Uh, it's a really excellent paper. It basically looks at the evidence from over 5,000 different brand assets, um, you mm. know, 33 categories. And it looks at sort of the the place that you can make to kind of develop gold standard distinctive assets. Um, so, you know, we talked about music and characters and all of that. But this paper goes into quite a lot of depth. So you've got the evidence from Ipsos, but also the the just the the professional expertise from JKR who are um, an, a, a a brilliant like leader in the branding space. So Hazel and Hazel and Lee probably brilliant tips. Um, Samira, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, James. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the On the Moment podcast. If you liked this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss upcoming episodes. And to suggest a guest or provide feedback, please visit our dedicated podcast hub at ownthemomentpod.com 